Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. I'm Patty Miller, CEO of Too Small to Fail, the Early Childhood Initiative of the Clinton Foundation. And on behalf of Too Small to Fail and our truly wonderful partners, the National Black Child Development Institute and Raising a Reader, we're just so excited to welcome you to our webinar today, Writing a New Chapter, Advancing Diversity in Children's Books. Um, our event today is going to take place kind of over the course of three chapters. Next slide, please. Um, and we're just so excited by this terrific lineup um, of speakers that we have assembled here for you today uh, to guide us through each of these chapters. Um, and before we get to it, um, each of our organizations, our hosting organizations, just wanted to provide very brief opening remarks about why we're here today and what brought us together to address this really important topic. Um, many of you are familiar with Too Small to Fail and others of you may not be. So very quickly by way of introduction, Too Small to Fail promotes early brain and language development uh, by supporting parents and caregivers with tools so they can talk, read and sing with their young children starting from the very moment that they're born. And through partnerships with hospitals and pediatricians, faith-based leaders, community-based organizations, businesses, entertainment industry leaders, and more, um, Too Small to Fail really works to meet parents where they are, to help prepare their children for success in school and beyond. And we really focus on trying to make small moments big by creating opportunities for meaningful engagement and interaction anytime and anywhere, wherever parents and families and kids happen to be. Um, the key to our work, when you think about parents talking, reading and singing with their kids is, is making sure that they have tools so that they can do that. Uh, research shows that the number of books that children have in the home is one of the strongest predictors of academic achievement. But what we know also from research is that many children don't have access to age appropriate books in their homes. Um, one study found that in lower income communities, there's an average of one book for every 300 children compared to in middle income families where the average is about 13 books in an individual home. Um, and these neighborhoods without significant, with significantly less access to books um, constitute book deserts, which can constrain children's opportunities to come to school ready to learn and ready to thrive. Um, but there's a pressing need not only to make sure kids have access to, to books, but also access to books that feature diversity. Um, and when we say diversity, we wanna highlight the wonderful work of We Need Diverse Books. Um, and they recognize all diverse experiences, including but not limited to LGBT, LGBTQIA, native people of color, gender diversity, people with disabilities, and ethnic, cultural, and religious minorities. Um, we know that young children's experiences with books and characters that they portray um, can shape their attitudes and beliefs um, about themselves and about their place in the world. Um, these rep representations also provide children with a sense of belonging, as well as a greater awareness and respect for others' identities and experiences. Today, we're going to hear more about all of this, and we hope that this conversation is the first of many. Um, as NBCDI and Raising a Reader and Too Small to Fail together explore how we can continue to advance uh, this discussion and issue in the months ahead. We're really asking for your thoughts and input about how we do that and just welcome your feedback today throughout the, the webinar and beyond. So before we get going, I just wanna take a moment to thank the Heising Simons Foundation, um, our wonderful thought partner and supporter that provided uh, support for this event and for the Too Small to Fail program. I also wanted to acknowledge the Dollar General Literacy Foundation, which gave Too Small to Fail um, a wonderful grant during the pandemic to provide nearly 25,000 diverse books that were distributed through a range of partners, um, including Navajo Nation, NBCDI, World Central Kitchen, and the National Diaper Bank Network. With that, I am just thrilled to turn the mic over to our wonderful partner, Michelle Torgerson, uh, the president and CEO of Raising a Reader. Thank you, Patty. 
Hello, it's so great to be in this community of listening and learning with you all today. I'm Michelle Torgerson, the president and CEO of Raising a Reader. We are so proud to co-host this event in partnership with Too Small to Fail and the National Black Child Development Institute and appreciate our panelists for their time today and thank all of you for attending. Raising a Reader partners with schools and community-based organizations to support families in building early literacy routines to foster brain development, healthy relationships, a love of reading, and the literacy skills critical for school success. Our geographic reach is broad, and I bet some of you may have heard of us. We serve more than 150,000 children from birth through age eight and their families annually in 36 states crisscrossing the United States. We have over 3,000 implementation sites that are implementing at least one of our three program models. Our Raising a Reader program sites include schools, libraries, childcare centers, as well as unexpected places such as parents' employers, housing developments, and food banks. And similar to our friends at Too Small to Fail, we too focus on meeting families where they're at. From day one, we knew the potential power of our book collection to serve as windows and mirrors for all children and families. And we now have over two decades of experience growing our understanding of how important books are to a greater sense of inclusion and belonging. Our one-of-a-kind multilingual book collection and curriculum puts equity, diversity, and belonging at the center, and it always has. We believe we can leverage our scale and reach and our book purchasing power to be part of pushing forward important conversations like this, to ensure that all children and their families have access to diverse and inclusive books. Thank you for joining us today for the first of many conversations. This is a collective effort. And I am now so pleased to introduce our wonderful co-host, Jocelyn Sturdivant, the Senior Vice President of Institutional Advancement at the National Black Child Development Institute. Thank you so much, Michelle. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jocelyn Sturdivant. And as Michelle said, I am the Senior Vice President for Institutional Advancement at the National Black Child Development Institute, also known as NBCDI. Established in 1970, NBCDI is a national nonprofit organization whose mission is to improve and advance the quality of life for Black children and families through education and advocacy. Our Read to Succeed program is designed to promote early literacy and language development by supporting families in establishing home libraries with culturally relevant and developmentally appropriate children's books. We, along with our national affiliate network, are committed to putting books with characters that look like the children we serve into their hands, homes, and hearts. We warmly invite you to learn more about MBCDI and our work. You will see links to our website and to our Read to Succeed program in the chat. And now I have the distinct honor of introducing our first speaker today, the wonderfully talented and dynamic Shabazz Larkin. Shabazz is an American artist, painter, writer, illustrator, bookmaker, and product designer. His practices of vandalizing photographs, overwhelming use of color, and bold typography veil Larkin's true intention to explore societal issues of race, justice, and religion. Jabaz is most known for his portraits that capture the beauty of resilience in Black culture. In 2019, Jabaz released his third book, The Thing About Bees, a love letter, which we will all have the pleasure of hearing him read today. Most recently, Jabaz and his wife, Ashley, have turned their attention to building a product design business, Larkin Art and Company, focused on producing artifacts that enrich the lives of people of color. Shabazz is also the father of two young sons. Shabazz, thank you so much for joining us today. To start, a, to start us off, we would like to set a vibrant tone for today's panel discussions by, as, by experiencing together what it's like to light up the life 
of a child with fantastic diverse literature. In order to do so, Shabazz, we would first like to have you take half a minute to share with us a little bit about your background and what inspired you to write The Thing About Bees. Then we'd love to have you read The Thing About Bees to our audience. And when you finish, please introduce our first moderator, our, our moderator, Patty Wong, who will introduce our panel. Shabazz, I am now turning it over to you. Thank you. Uh, that, was a, that was a great introduction. Um, and I, I appreciate being here um, with, with all of my librarians and book people. Um, those are my favorite people. Uh, and I wrote this book, The Thing About Bees, um, really as a way to sort of connect with my sons who are sort of budding and growing. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of the images that you see in this book are sort of, sort of feel like something from uh, Norman Rockwell. Um, and that's because I just remember seeing Norman Rockwell pictures as a kid, this very sort of like American sort of style. It's, it seemed like the very American sort of illustration style. Um, but, uh, uh, I, I always, I always, I always felt like there was a, it was a world that wasn't mine. <laughs> and so doing this book was really an opportunity, even in this sort of square classic storybook format was really to say, hey, let me paint some new people in, in this sort of classic American world. So, um, so this is just me and my sons kind of frolicking around, uh, Nashville, so that where I live. So without, uh, with that, I, I'd love to just jump in it. So the book is called The Thing About Bees, A Love Letter. <clears throat> this book is dedicated to my sons who teach me what it means to be fearless. And I start this book off with a little science. When a bee and a flower love each other very much, a fruit is born. <laughs> the flower makes a yellow sticky dust called pollen. The bee, <laughs> and as the bee drinks the flower's nectar, she gets pollen all over her body. The, me, the bee moves from one flower to another. Then we wait and wait and wait and presto. The flower turns into a fruit that we can eat. And this is a process called pollination. With that, here's the thing about bees. Sometimes bees can be a bit rude. They fly in your face and prance on your food. They buzz in the bushes and buzz in your ear. They sneak up behind you and fill you with fear. And worst of all, they do this thing called sting. Ouch! We may want bees gone because their sting hurts, but if they were all gone, it would hurt much worse. Without bees, there'd be no more picnics with watermelon. There'd be no more smoothies with mango. There'd be no more strawberries for shortcakes and no more avocados for tacos. There'd be no apples, which means no more pie, no more cucumbers, which means no more pickles, no more blueberries and raspberries for pancakes or sweet cherries to drizzle. Because some foods won't grow without bees to help them along. In a way, the bees are just like you. You, you buzz in the bushes and buzz in my ear. You sneak up behind me and fill me with fear. You fly in my face and prance on my food. You even sting when you're in a bad mood. But I never stop loving you. You're my sweet cherry, the apple pie of my eye. You're my cucumber pickle, my bumblebee in the sky. You're my cold watermelon at a picnic in the park. You're the avocados on my tacos. 
you're my strawberry heart. Without those little buzzers, the world wouldn't know what to do. That's the thing about bees. We need them just as much as we need you. Now I have a lot to learn from bees. I wrote this book because I have a ridiculous fear of bees. When my sons were born, I didn't wanna pass that fear to them. So I set out to discover all that I could about the little buzzers. I learned three things about bees. First, I learned that every living creature has a special part to play in the world. And that includes you. Second, when I learn more about the scary thing, the thing feels less scary to me. Third, I researched which bees and wasps are kind and which are kind of mean. I made a guide to help you see the difference too. It's brave to try to understand the things that scare us. Now go be brave. Love, Shabazz. Now in the back here, I've made a guide for everyone who's like me, scared of bees. It's a guide that says everything you need to know about how not to get stung, a guide to bees and wasps from kind to kind of mean. Now I'm not going to read all this to you now and take up too much time, but it's... Uh, just know that bumblebees are the kind ones <laughs> and all the bees are the kind ones, carpenter bees and honey bees are the kind ones, but the yellow jackets are the ones that if they sing you, you better run. But seriously, we need to love the pollinators. Do all you can to save the bees, please. And if you're still afraid of bees, you can wear a beekeeper suit because we're all beekeepers. On the back here of this book, I've inscribed this sort of mantra that says love will conquer fear. And that's the thing about bees. Thank you for, for uh, taking part uh, of uh, the reading of this. Uh, but uh, our next guest uh, has a big job on her hands and is a real gift to speak to us today. She comes a long line of heroes uh, to authors like me and readers like you. She stands in the shoes of Dorothy B. Porter, the great decolonizer of the Dewey Decimal System, of Arturo Alfonso Schomburg, the great founder of the Negro Society of Historical Research and collector of our books, uh, Clara Stanton Jones, the first black president of the American Library Association, Library Association, and now Patty Wong. She's received all kinds of awards from the 2012 ALA Equitable Award, Equity Award, the Distinguished Service Award in 2014. She was acknowledged as the member of the year in 2012 by the California Library Association. And my own publisher, Philip Lee, has a few personal stories of them working in the bookstore together in college. So she's got a legit history here, okay? After all this time, she's still acting as our champion of access uh, with the very difficult task to keep books accessible and increasingly library averse, book averse, reading averse, society, she's working to connect the library to the community. And with that, please do a little dance for all, for, for the first Asian American to serve as president of the American Library Association, Patty Wong. Hello, everyone. And thank you all so much. Thank you, Shabazz, for that beautiful, very kind, and warm introduction and the beautiful reading of your wonderful book. Um, and my sincere thanks to Too Small to Fail, the National Black Child Development Institute and Raising a Reader for hosting this very important event, highlighting a topic that is near and dear to my heart, both as city librarian uh, for the Santa Clara City Library and as the first Asian American president at the American Library Association. This topic is so very important to me, um, both personally and professionally. 
Um, and that's because as a young child, um, I, I didn't see myself, I rarely saw myself or my diverse community in picture books for my age. And that lack of connection continued throughout my development. Thankfully, um, it's changed today. And children need to see themselves and others and learn to appreciate and empathize as we make sense of our communities and the world we live in today. Dr. Rudeen Sims Bishop shared that concept of the need for diversity in children's books as a responsibility and that books can and do serve as mirrors to reflect positive and affirming support for children in their development and windows and sliding glass doors to enter that world. I am now delighted to kick off our first panel conversation, chapter one, diversity in children's books, why it matters. And we have three incredibly inspiring and esteemed panelists, including, our own Shabazz Larkin. Thank you so much for staying on for this conversation, Shabazz. KT Horney, Director of the Cooperative Children's Book Center, University of Wisconsin, Madison. Welcome. And Dr. Yoma um, Iruka, Professor of Public Policy and Founding Director of the Equity Research Action Coalition, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I'd love to start uh, with you, KT, who I've been fortunate to know for so many years. Um, I have such a great respect and admiration for your work on this, on this issue in particular. Um, KT, it would be great if you could kick off our panel conversation by providing an overview and a landscape of diversity in children's books today. Um, what have we learned and what do we know today? Katie? Thank you, Patty. I would be happy to, and I have some slides to go along with my presentation. So um, if you wanna start the slideshow, I'm gonna show you some numbers um, historically and um, going back through um, and going up to today. Um, and I am not seeing the slides, are they on? There they go. Okay, this is, um, Patty mentioned um, Rudine Sims Bishop, um, seminal research on looking at children's books as both windows and mirrors. And this image was done uh, a couple of years ago, but it uses that uh, concept showing children um, what their own mirrors would be based on uh, what race they belong to. And you can see the white child has a huge number of mirrors, a disco ball, a scene themselves re reflected everywhere. Um, and then the next highest category are books with animal characters. So that's what the little bear represents. And then as your eye moves uh, going toward the left of the screen, it gets down to um, a child who's just looking at a tiny shard of glass that would be American Indian First Nation child. Um, so this is just a visual representation if you wanna to move to the next slide, please. Uh, the CCBC, um, we started keeping track of these statistics back in 1985, when my colleague and predecessor, Jenny Moore Cruz, was a member of the Coretta Scott King Award Committee. And as a member of Coretta Scott King, Jenny knew exactly how many books were eligible back in 1985. And this is an award that goes to African-American authors and illustrators. And in 1985, it was a year when there were about 3,000 children's books published. There were just 18 that were written or illustrated by African Americans. And we decided to start documenting that number um, in an annual publication we have. And you can see um, the orange line starting in 1985 with 18, the second year there were 18 again. And then you see it goes up a little bit each year until we reached about 1991, then it dipped. Um, and around that time, we began to think about how, you know, there are books that are about black people that are not written or illustrated by black people. Um, and so we began to keep track of those two separate things. And the dotted line shows you the books that are about um, black characters that are written by people who are not themselves black. 
And also something that happened in 1994 is people began asking us about what about other ethnic groups? So we began to keep track of um, the, the four main ethnic groups at that time that we identified African-American, um, American Indian, Asian, back then with Asian Pacific, Asian Pacific American and Latinx. And you can see how those numbers just really sort of um, flatline um, over that period of time until 2014. Uh, you, you see it go up and down a little bit, but there's never really a huge amount of progress. If you wanna go on to the next slide, this picks it up at about 2004. And for this one, we just combined all of the different ethnic groups. So this is showing you picture books that feature children who are not white. And um, the red line at the bottom are the books, um, the authors that are um, BIPOC authors, um, black indigenous people of color. And so that number has gone up a little bit and actually quite significantly um, starting in 2014, you see it rise up. And the blue line on top is the number of books that are um, about black, indigenous, and people of color, but that are not by them. So um, again, you see that there are always many more books written by people who are from outside the cultures that they're writing about. Um, but we do see um, what, what I th think is really notable about this graph is that in 2014, start to see those numbers tick up. That uh, was the establishment of We Need Diverse Books. And We Need Diverse Books has just done an excellent job uh, through the years at um, keeping this issue in front of people's um, faces all the time. And, you know, we just, we hear about it. Um, so we keep it in mind. You wanna move on to the next slide. And then um, the, you're the first people seeing this, the, the uh, statistics for 2022. We just crunched some preliminary numbers yesterday. And the, the positive thing is you can see that um, things are going up in a little bit. Um, we're still about half of the books about white characters um, and um, over 75% of the books are being written by white authors. But that just shows you um, the breakdown of what we, we've seen. We've added some categories, including Arab, Arab American and Pacific Islander. Um, racially ambiguous are books that show children with brown skin and they could be any race. Um, we can't identify, excuse me, identify which there are. And the final slide um, just puts out there some other types of diversity to consider. Um, we've already talked a little bit about them, gender, disability, religious minorities, LGBTQ, family structure, class, and genre. So with that, I'll turn things back over to Patty. Thank you so much, Katie, for sharing that great information. Um, it, it provides a lot of context for what we're talking about today. Um, uh, Dr. Iruka, I'd love to turn now to you. Um, and, and, and our audience can hear about the important work and perspectives on this topic. Why does diverse representation in children's literature matter so much? And thank you. Thank you, Patty. And again, congratulations on your historic appointment. It's such a, a great honor there. And obviously, thank you also to MBCDI, Ray Marita, and Too Small to Fail uh, for having me join this amazing panel. And of course, Shabazz, but his just phenomenal book and phenomenal reading was just such an honor. So in response to your question, if you can go ahead and share my slides. Again, I'll just say I'm a developmental psychologist. I like data, but I won't show too much data. But I wanted to make sure to give you some imagery, right? Because in the end of it, the power of books is because of the imagery and what they, they, they sort of connote to you. So again, as an early childhood sort of scholar researcher, I want us to understand why books and diversity of books really matter. First and foremost, and I am speaking to the choir here, we know that the early years set the foundation for school and life success. Right, so in this imagery, what you're just basically seeing on the left-hand side is that what happens early on in life really does set a little bit of the trajectory for the life course. 
So if you grow up in a particular kind of household with less stress, more opportunities, then your the life course is likely to be easier. Now, if you grew up in a household where there's more challenges, then, then the challenges obviously over the life course may be harder. Again, it's not fatalistic, but it's important for us to recognize the importance of both the prenatal, but also the early childhood years, which is really, especially the first thousand days. Um, and I'll show even more why the first thousand days and even the, the, the first 2000 days, which is that birth to three and especially the birth to five period that we sort of call the preschool years, we know is a sensitive periods of brain development, right? And, and so again, if you look at this figure here, if you look at the lines, right? So you see a lot of the lines, the tip of them happens actually when kids are still in that two to three, right? So think about it, this is when your language, is, the foundation for language is being set, conceptualization is being set, emotional control, hearing, vision, a lot of things are being set to prepare you really for school in life. And so if you see that line, that dark line, um, that five years old, you see a lot of things have already reached the tipping point. And now is really much where we're trying to consolidate and use that to, to basically to learn, right? So it's that whole idea of learning to read and reading to learn, right? And so this is why it's really important that when we think about books, that we think about is so critically important, especially when that is the foundation for children's development. And we also know that the early reading skills, you know, your language and literacy actually sets, it's actually predicts your reading achievements. And of course, with some of our reports that we see, we do see a reading achievement predicts a lot of things from school income. But of course, some people argue also the, the number of beds they create in prison. Next slide. So again, the first thousand day matter. And I want to harpen back to what KT said about the books. Right, think about it. You're a young child, you're developing a whole lot of things, right? Because the first thousand days, the first 2000 days, children are scientists. They're looking at the world. They're looking, and books is one of the vehicles that they use to see the world. And if they see that, one well, my goodness, the majority of the books that I'm reading are pretty much white kids, and the other ones are really about animals, and there's nothing about me. What sort of conclusion will you take if you're a black child, a Latina child? a native child, an Asian Pacific Island child, like what is the message you get, right? So I show you this imagery about the power of race and how much race is literally the undercurrent in the foundation. And so the fact that we have the majority of books written about white children and also the majority of authors being white based on KT's data tells us that, that we are positioning children already about how to see the world. And this figure tells you early on that even as early as three months old, children are, are literally following those who look like their caregivers. So if your caregiver is white, they're gonna track you. And this is a study from, from um, England, right? By the time children are one or two years old, they're able to sort of uh, really think about people in terms of whether their the skin is whiter, like whiter shade or you know browner shade, right? That's when kids begin to, to interpret certain things. By 30 months, they're able to sort of use race categories like I'm black or brown, or you're not black or brown. And really, and by the time they're three, they're able to actually express racial prejudice. I don't want to play with you because you know what your skin doesn't look like is nice. Your skin doesn't look like it's great, right? And by the age of four to five, they're making decisions play about behaviors like, oh, look, the black children are being kicked out, or oh, the children who look a little brown or lighter brown or don't know how to speak English, right? They are getting messages. And part of the messages they get is from the books they read. And if they don't see themselves in the books, they're gonna make decisions about how they fit into the world, right? This is the power of books and one that we cannot ignore. Next slide, please. And so to me, we have to think about books as a way to engage, explore and empower children, right? This idea is that books are really the ways that we begin to get knowledge to also inquire. This is the same way for children. If you're an early child educator, early child professional, books are one of the ways that you shape children's sort of emotion regulation. How do you deal with trauma? How do you deal with loss of friends, right? Another way is you can use books to explore, right? You can explore diversity, differences, issues of privilege, issues of racism, again, from a child-centered kind of way. And then of course, books can be used to empower Think about it, right? We are now in a moment in time again when books are, are being used as a tool of either oppression or power, 
where certain kind of books are being said that we don't want it in our classroom or education space because it makes people feel uncomfortable. Think about it, when enslaved people were brought here, one of the ways to keep them enslaved and without power and to try to keep them uneducated was literally through not ensuring that they did never have access to books, right? And, and the fact that we're actually at a point where books are being used as a tool of power means that we need to understand not just about diversity of books, it's also the access to books and also the access to particular books that speaks to the humanity of different groups of people. Black people have a history, Latin people have a history, Asian people have a history, and indigenous people have a history. If we do not know that history, we are going to probably repeat it. And again, as Frederick Douglass said, once you learn to read, you'll be forever free. And if we're not reading about Jewish communities and the Holocaust, if we're not reading about the attempted eradication of natives, or the enslavement of, of Black people, Asian people, and other people of color, then we are going to be bound to, to, to repeat it. Books are the freedom. And for young children, our books need to set them free. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Patty. You're muted, Patty. Thank you, Dr. Iruka, um, for that uh, call to action. Absolutely, it's, it, it, was, it was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, Shabazz, now we are back to you. We'd love to hear your thoughts and responses to what our panelists shared and why this topic has been it's so important to you in particular as an author, as an activist, as an artist, and of course, one of the biggest jobs as a parent. I don't know I have much to say after Dr. Ruka. <laughs> did I say the name? Did I say your name? Probably. You did, okay. thank you. Dr. You laid it down. <laughs> I don't have much to say, but I was I'll I'll share a story. I'll share a story uh, because that was very powerful. Thank you for sharing that really succinct picture of feelings that I have so often <laughs> and uh, sort of it, the, the, you definitely shared sort of the fire behind why I am passionate about making books but also just passionate as an artist um, uh, when I was uh, when my son was young you mentioned around three is where you sort of recognize your your brownness my son came to me uh, 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 and he said, Hey, I don't like the color. I don't like the way my skin, I don't know why my skin looks like this. Now look, <laughs> I'm a painter who plays pit portraits of black. Look, doc, doc, I mean, I wrote Dr. Ruka behind you. That's what my house looks like. You know, you know, these are the, these are the images I have around my house, right? I paint, I'm painting black people everywhere, right? Black people at my table, right? Uh, you know, I, my kids were raised in Brooklyn for most of their lives. You know, the school that they go to is run by three black women, you know? Uh, it, 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 and still my son comes to me and tells me I don't like my skin. How is this possible, right? And, and so to me that says that uh, that the need to sort of love, to, 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 to show ourselves, the mirrors that you showed, that K KT showed were so important to show ourselves. It's not enough to see one book. It's not, um, what's, the, what's the little boy, uh, a, a snowy day? A snowy day is not enough, you know? Uh, and Eric Carl's, you know, I love them. I love the little books about the worms and they're great but they're not enough. They, they need to be seen again and again and again. And, you know, it was important when Philip and I talk about the importance of the book I read to you all, it's because when I go around and I share this with kids, I talk about what it means to be an environmentalist, what it means to be a scientist, you know? And so for, for kids to see themselves, not just <laughs> fighting oppression, right? Because the innocence of a child doesn't want to just spend all the time reading about fighting oppression and Dr. Martin Luther King, although I'm, you know, I love him too, but we just want to see about like, hey, I just want to, I want to read 
books about bees. I want to read books about uh, playing with bubbles. You know, I, you know, uh, you know, because these are sort of the uh, um, ubiquitous sort of uh, experiences and influences that we have. You know, um, the next story I want to tell is, yeah, my wife and I were because of a certain circumstance is we found ourselves looking for a new school. Uh, and um, uh, um, we went and we, we went to talk to the administrator. And as we were touring the school, we asked, hey, what's, uh, you know, what, what's your programming for teaching Black history? Um, you know, and um, the, the administrator, uh, God bless her heart, looked at me and said, well, you know, if, I, if we spend so much time teaching Black history, then we can't teach American history. My God. My God, well, she was an uninformed uh, a member of the administration, so I give them grace. Uh, but so there is a responsibility to the child, right? But there's also a responsibility to our educators, right? Our teachers, our parents, even, right? These stories aren't just a need for kids, they're a need for me as an adult. I learned a lot from you know, there's a book that I just read, uh, uh, Birth by Water, I think, the 1669 Project, and, and uh, such a beautiful, beautiful depiction. I learned some stuff, <laughs> you know, about I'm learning my own stories, because when, when you sort of speak to children, you speak to the family, right? Because, because the children's story, culture is created in order to protect those who are weakest among us right? Um, our children, right? They're there to help us. Hey, if I need strength, if I need confidence, if I need self-love, you know, our stories is what we turn to for those things. But we also sort of turn to those, to stories for, 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 for ostracizing certain communities. We turn to our stories for sort of uh, uh, what we think is right and wrong. Um, and so there is a responsibility to the child, to the, to the educators, to us adults. Um, and the last story I'll tell is, you know, when I was, when I was in college, I came across an image by Kahindi Wali, who's my favorite artist. And it's an image of this, this image here was in the, is in the Richmond uh, Museum of, of Art. And it was the first time I had seen this uh, what he does is he sort of goes around and he takes pictures of black people and he has them sort of pose like these, you know, Renaissance kingly. And I remember seeing this, this is sort of the moment where I went from liking making art to becoming an artist is because when I saw this, I saw myself, I saw my hero. I saw the guy that I wanted to be when I was in high school. And instead of having this idea that this was a thug, that this was a drug dealer, and because this is what I grew up with. I mean, I went to a school with all black people and still this image of black people was imprinted in my soul that I wasn't allowed to even be who I was. And so we teach ourselves safe self-hatred, right? And so when I saw this, I wept, I cried for hours because, because he looked like me. And he, he, and he, and he looked like a king. And, um, and I, I just, uh, from that moment on is where I said, Hey, I want to tell stories of black people. I want to paint images of black people. I want to tell us, uh, because if I don't, who will, uh, and, I, and so, um, and so the last thing I say is that we have a responsibility to ourselves to tell our stories you know, um, to, to understand, to understand more. If I don't, if, if we don't tell our own stories, then who will? So uh, I, 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 I'm, you know, we're sort of committed to telling, to telling these stories and um, more than, you know, beyond the civil rights stories, which I love our civil rights stories, but they can't be, I, I, we don't want to live in that sort of, sort of repeated trauma uh, every day. Uh, we want to just live our lives of uh, live our lives and and um, and and I think that the, the the freedom from that comes from the stories that we tell. So I, it's, to me, that's that's why it's important to uh, uh, to tell these stories and and bring about these um, books. I think I answered the question, but maybe not. <laughs> it's, 
Chavez, you did that and so much more. Thank you for those powerful and rich words and, and the commitment I think we have to one another and that responsibility uh, to make sure that children um, and actually people of all ages see themselves represented in the, in the literature that we bring to life to make sense of the world. Um, maybe Dr. Ruka and, and, and Katie, um, we're, we have a little bit more time than we thought. So if we could have maybe a, a, another, you know, your words also of, of, you know, there's been such great rich um, uh, contributions to our information sharing today. Um, what excites you about, you know, about the new world of children's literature and, and how we are making a difference um, in terms of the lives of our community? I can jump in and say um, one of the things that excites me about the new world of children's literature is that really outstanding books by BIPOC authors and illustrators are getting recognition. Um, there have been great books for a long time out there and it always hurts my heart when I hear someone say, I didn't know about these books. I didn't know these books existed. And that tells me we as librarians, teachers aren't doing our jobs of putting these books in front of kids. But right now we are seeing absolutely amazing books and they are being recognized for their outstanding literary and artistic quality. Um, the recent announcements of the Newberry and the Caldecott Awards, for example, for this year and last year, last year, an indigenous author, or sorry, indigenous illustrator won the Caldecott Award ever. And this year, um, also an indigenous author was recognized by the Newberry Committee for the first time. So, and then the, the Newberry, the award-winning books, I would say of the last five to six years have really reflected the diversity, the outstanding books that um, reflect diversity that we see in our world. And that's actually very exciting for me as a, as a librarian and a lover of books. I'll just briefly add, um, and I thought KT said exactly what I was gonna say, but I will also expand to say, and even to connect it to Shabazz's earlier point, that I'm loving sort of the new books that really speak to the diaspora, particularly of black people, indigenous people. Oftentimes you're like, oh my goodness, how about slavery? No. You know, you could talk about the richness of, of Black people across many different parts of the continent, including the motherland. So being able to, to see authors crossing those boundaries and showing particularly Blackness in ways that's just natural and just part of humanity, that's one. The second thing I would say that's actually amazing is to now see books coming into the social justice, economic justice, racial justice realm, right? Books have been treated as kind of this passive, read a book and you're smart but to know that the Justice and Library Association is now actively engaged to understand that books and reading has, has impact across the board over the years and has impact on people's well-being, their health, their economics. So, so I'm loving at least attention to the power of book reading, but also the power of authorship in many ways and, and the power of voices to bring humanity. So I'm excited in many ways but also I'm also scared of it, right? Because the more voices of color uh, that come forward, the more that we're going to see pushback, but we need associations like the one that you're ahead of Patty to continue to speak to the power of all these voices being heard, even as policies are being created to stem that tide. Thank you so much, all of you. And my heartfelt thanks to our wonderful panelists for sharing your thoughts and perspectives with our audience. Uh, we look forward to having you back in a few minutes for a, a final question um, towards the end of our event. Don't worry, audience members. Um, it's not quite goodbye yet for KT, Dr. Iruka, and Shabazz. Um, now I'm very excited and filled with suspense as we uh, turn the page to chapter two, which is Innovative Initiatives to Advance Diversity in Children's Literature. I'd like to invite our chapter two panelists to join us. Welcome, and thank you so much for being here. I'm thrilled to introduce our wonderful panelists, and they are Danielle Clayton, COO, We Need Diverse Books, Philip Lee, Publisher, Readers to Eaters, Cynthia Litek-Smith, 
author and curator heart drum at Harper Collins Children's Books. And Kyle Zimmer, CEO and co-founder of First Book. Kyle, hello. Thanks again for being here. Great I'd love to, to be here. Thank you. Welcome. I'd love to start with you. Please sure. tell us about First Book and innovative efforts your organization has engaged in to promote diversity in children's literature, along with other innovations in this area that you'd like to share. And welcome. Thanks. It's, it's an incredible honor to be here. And I really uh, the data that's been shared, it's I'm having a tough time keeping myself in my chair, uh, but I, I know we, you know, time is tight and we want to uh, cover a lot of ground. And I thought I would start with a quick flyover of First Book. For those of you who might not be familiar with us, we're a nonprofit social enterprise. And for all of our 30 years, we've really been dedicated to advancing educational equity for children in poverty. We've built the largest and fastest growing online network of formal and informal educators serving underserved kids ages zero to 18. Our network currently numbers more than 525,000 educators and thousands more are joining every month. And the importance of this online community that we've built is that we use the strength of this aggregated community. We really listen to what's going on in those classrooms, in those programs, through our research arm, which is called First Book Research and Insights. And so we constantly have active, engaged voices from preschools, from after schools, Title I classrooms, homeless shelters, libraries, and even barber shops. And then we take the voice of that first book community and we use it to inform everything we do, including all the books and resources that we make available through our e-commerce site, which is called the First Book Marketplace. At present, we provide about 17 million books annually and diverse through the marketplace and diverse books are a constant priority for the educators we serve. And so we were very dedicated to using the market strength that we've built to elevate the market for diverse content. We push it through, we push the publishers, we push the prices down for our, for our network, and we constantly promote relevancy and diversity of content. And that means authors and illustrators as well. At present, it fluctuates, but at present it runs about 50% of the books we provide are diverse content from one lens or another. And today, in addition to sort of the fundamentals of First Book, I want to share a new initiative that First Book has launched that absolutely has its roots in reading high quality, highly diverse books. And as we've already discussed, reading diverse books elevates an interest in reading, but it also increases self-awareness and importantly, it increases empathy for others. Just last week, we launched something called Time for Change. It's a program that turns that elevated empathy into action. In partnership with Ashoka and Odama Pige, which is a watchmaker, Time for Change is designed to build a world in which all young people, particularly those from low income and historically excluded communities, grow up with the support and resources to thrive as powerful change makers, solving problems, large and small, in their families, in their schools, in their communities and beyond. It's a world that will be more just and equitable because everyone will have power. Time for Change is founded on the understanding that because our world is experiencing unprecedented and accelerated rates of change, that we have to work together to build 
uh, systems to raise empathetic change makers who build on the powerful and diverse content that we all are working to provide and that are able to identify issues that they care about and then create change for themselves and the common good. It's very much what Dr. Aruka just referred to when she said, we have to promote social justice. That's what this is about. Time for, for Change will equip educators with new practical tools, books, and step-by-step -step guidance for nurturing change-making in their students. It will showcase stories of young change-makers and their ideas for making positive changes in their lives. And we've just released our first resource, uh, which is available to download for free at fbmarketplace.org. Just click on the tab that says free resources and it's right there. It's a guidebook uh, that is a resource that explains what change making is, why it's important. It helps to align change making with the common core. It outlines activities and discussion points and shares stories of young people who are change makers, young people of all uh, races and cultures and all ages. And in addition, the first book curation team, because our roots are always with books, has identified a wonderful set of new books about change makers, and it especially elevates change makers of different races, cultures, backgrounds, and ages, and it, it will share those stories uh, with our full network of, of our community. So it's all about activism, it's all about social justice, it's all about civic engagement. So I'm happy to answer questions either during the session or, or online afterwards, but uh, delighted to be part of the conversation. Thank you so much, Kyle, um, for sharing that rich, um, innovative systems changing kind of work and, and creating stronger access to all of these materials and the call to action and activism that you bring with First Book. Um, congratulations on all that wonderful work. Um, and we look forward to hearing more about it later. Um, now I'd love to turn the floor over to my dear friend, Philip Lee. Um, it's so great to be part of this event together. Um, Philip, tell us about Readers to Eaters, along with your perspectives on innovative ways that you, and perhaps um, even other publishers, um, are working to advance diversity in children's literature. And welcome, always good to see you. Hey, um, hi, Patty. So good to see you and so good to see everybody here. And, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this great conversation. So like Patty says, I'm Philip Lee. I'm publisher of Readers to Eaters. So the one thing I bring in as a publisher as a, and an, also as a small independent uh, publisher um, based in San Francisco is that I like to think that we come in with a different perspective talking about race and culture and diversity, you know, and as a publisher, we think about two things, you know, um, more than two things, but let's say we think in terms of the content, the kind of books that we want to produce, but we also think about distribution. How do we get books into the hands of readers? And I, and I just want to make sure that we'll get to talk a little bit about that in my talk, but also like later on in our, in our panel conversation, because I think it's so important. So, you know, we, uh, our company's called Readers Readers, we focus on culture you know, and culture about food. So I just want to quickly give a little shout out this week or today, or uh, because it's Chinese New Year. And I brought you some, a little, I, um, I brought a little sh show and tell. This is my favorite childhood food. It's a Chinese barbecue pork bun that I just picked up from Chinatown earlier. And, um, and it's my favorite childhood food because it was a, it's a food that I connected, and I grew up in Hong Kong. And I came here to, to the US when I was a teenager. And it's meaningful to me now. Of course, it's my favorite food, not because it's good for me, you know, it's not because it's healthy. And I can't even say it's the most tastiest thing I like, but it, I connect with this food because it was the reward given to me by my family when I did well in school 
or when we have celebrations, because as a kid, they're so easy to just hold up a bun and you break up and there's barbecue pork inside, it's delicious, it's easy to eat. And so I still think back as a reward. So every time after a presentation like today, I'll, I like to have a pork bun and, and, and pat myself on the shoulder. But that's what in, in this case, I like to think in terms of why food is important because it's not about, um, it's, it's not just about uh, uh, nutrition and, and, and health, but it's also about culture and human connection, you know? And, and this is how we go about talking about food, diversity and culture. You know, and so um, so we start Readers to Eaters in um, now actually this year, this spring will be will mark will mark our tenth anniversary of publishing books um, this this year. And at first, people think about us thinking like, why do we publish books about food? Isn't that very limiting? But in fact, it's it's on the reverse. Food to us is is foundational to the human experience, and it connects us to us all. We can all always we talk we tell stories about food. Our you know food is our vehicle, but our lens is people. You know, so we're always looking at at cultures through this lens of food, and through food, of yes, again, it's about health and nutrition. But through food, we can use it to talk about human history, talk about social justice, talk about climate issues, and just all these different ways, and and in a, in a scale that very young children to high school kids can connect with, to feel they can empower to connect with, you know? And so, and also food again, and the vocabulary of food is really fundamental to building again, vocabulary, but therefore understanding of other cultures. So we present to very young kids the five flavors, sour, sweet, bitter, salty, umami. But, but by using these things, you don't just understand about, uh, about food, but you understand other culture, because again, I'm Chinese and I grew up eating bitter melons and that bitter is not an awful thing to me. But how many stories we hear about kids, you know, get alienated at the school cafeteria during lunchtime because they eat food that is unfamiliar to other cultures. But, and so by knowing these flavors, by understanding flavors, you're actually understanding other cultures. So this is kind of how our approach to talking about food and culture and diversity. You know, so that's our overall philosophy. And very quickly, in terms of editorial, you know, in terms of the kind of books we publish, I'm just so pleased that Shabazz um, joined us today and, and read the thing about bees. And because, you know, of course, it's a wonderful book, but it really kind of typifies uh, the kind of stories that we want to talk about in terms of diversity. First, it is a, it is a universal human story. It's a story about fatherhood and overcoming fear. You know, and it is also a story about current issues, current affairs, about climate change and climate action. You know, and you know, thirdly, it's also about, of course, a story about an African American family celebrating Black joy, all through the lens of food. You know, and so that's what we try to do. And through this lens of food, again, like it tells a lot of things that people can connect with and often miss it because we publish books, we you know, talk, have a lot of conversation now about climate issues and often that is not a very diverse conversation. You know, and the people who's in the climate conversation are also not very diverse. But by having books like this, it suddenly adds you know, uh, a lot to the, to the conversation. Another example you know, of the books we do, I mean, just gonna pick one other book, like a book that we published a few years ago, you know, called Chef Roy Choi and the Street Food Remix. And, um, co-written by Jacqueline Briggs Barton and actually my wife, Jun Jo Lee. And I say, this is a story about a, a, a street cook, uh, a, 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 the, the, the street, street uh, cook chef in LA to start a whole food truck movement. And, um, and of course, like kids connect with it because it's about street food and food trucks and so on. It's really fun and, and in a way trendy. In fact, he started the whole food truck movement. But actually what this story really becomes is talking about our immigration history. You know, the whole idea of like, he, he started this uh, uh, street truck movement in LA, not because it was a marketing gimmick by putting the Korean barbecue on a taco, but because Koreatown in LA where he grew up is right next to the Mexican neighborhood and the kids hung out together, you know? And without the 1965 Immigration Act that allows new immigration, actually more like uh, uh, ended a lot of immigration discrimination laws, a lot of, um, new, so, so the 1965 immigration allowed new immigrants to come to America and changed our menu, 
change the kind of food that we could eat. And so through this book about a street cook, we actually are able to talk about immigration history and social justice issues, you know, because the chef then end up taking his food truck, trying to, to bring good food to uh, uh, low income communities and so on. You know, so that's how we go about talking about diversity and social justice, you know, through a very concrete thing like food. And kids read these stories and feel like, oh, I can get involved. And in fact, by the way, we make a point of telling very current stories because we want kids to understand that it's a current movement that they can get involved with. It's not, I mean, history is always important, but also often kids read, we find when we do, do present to kids is that they find something that happened in the past. It's not something they can, they can do anything about, you know, and, and so they want to get involved. That's what we learn from, from new people. And all that said, another example of a book that we're really excited about is uh, that we're publishing coming next year, 2023. Um, it's, a, it's a book we're partnering with the Museum of Food and Drink in New York. And they are publishing this um, African slash American Making a Nation's Table. It's an exhibit on over 400 years of African-American history through food. You know, in America, actually it goes back from Africa and how enslaved people bring their food culture to America and how it's changed and how it evolved over the 400 plus years in the US. And so it's a very powerful story. Um, so that's how we, uh, we go about talking, uh, you know, our, our, our stories and how we uh, publish our books. And the other thing I would just add really quickly is about our partnership program. You know, again, how do we get books to the hands of the readers? You know, and again, our company is for readers to eaters. And so the first place we go to is the readers, like schools and libraries have actually becoming more and more like food hubs. They are, of course, hosting community gardens, farmers markets in, the, in their backyard, but they are also through summer meal programs are actually feeding kids in very large scale. Um, yet, Actually, you know, we like, and uh, they're, they're not actually involved with a lot of food organizations yet. And so something that we uh, have been able to do is help create uh, or facilitate a lot of connections with libraries and food organizations. And the reverse is that now we also go to the eater part. You know, farmers markets, for example, are really interested in bringing more um, diverse families to the markets. And so, but they are, and they are now using WIC and SNAP ad funds to buy books to use for, to, you know, their, their mission is to promote nutrition education, but they don't usually use nutrition education through food, yeah, excuse me, through books. And so now they are reading books about food at the farmers market using USDA funding such as WIC and US uh, and, um, and WIC and SNAP ad. And in fact, uh, I think Patty can also have some experience in terms of librarians going to WIC centers now and doing reading. And so again, very exciting, these different, the different partnerships of how do we get hands, uh, getting books into the hands of readers. And finally, a quick shout out to the Clinton Foundation and Too Small to, to Fail. I, and just like one of the things I'm really excited about getting involved partnering with them is that how or the creative way they do in terms of getting, um, I think like Patty, um, Patty Miller said, said in the beginning, making small moments big and bringing like books into the community, you know, such as the laundromat program, such as going to family courts, you know, bringing, bringing, using that as a reading locations. And so I think there's great opportunity to promote diverse books to diverse communities. So I'll end it right here and look forward to talking some more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip, for sharing um, your brilliance always um, uh, and, and for doing that important, not only an inspiring work, but seeing that intersectionality of um, not just food, but creating community <clears throat> and uplifting um, all that you do um, through the work and gathering all of us to hear, even here together. Thank you. Thank you for that important work. Um, Cynthia, now let's turn to you. So nice to have you here. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, I'd love to share, have you share your perspective as publisher and author on, on how we can all advance diversity in children's literature. Um, and, and specifically, how has Heart Drum worked um, to move the needle in this area? And welcome. Mado, thank you, my dear friends. I am grateful for your interest and so honored to be in conversation with you all. As mentioned, my name is Cynthia Lydic-Smith. 
It may be useful to know that I am a tribally enrolled citizen of Muscogee Nation, which is located within the borders of the state of Oklahoma. First, I'll begin with a little bit of context on Native Kidlet more generally, um, drawing on my own experience. And though I'll be speaking from an indigenous lens, much of what I have to say does in fact apply to parallel cultural groups like those that Dr. Horning mentioned earlier. I first began writing in the mid 1990s and my first book came out in the year 2000. It is called Jingle Dancer and it was considered noteworthy at the time because it was contemporary, because it featured a middle class native neighborhood, because it included an Afro indigenous or black Indian character in the cast and because one of the main characters was a native woman who was also an attorney. Uh, I mentioned this because early on, I got some pushback from readers who thought that that was a bit too aspirational. More than one person said to me, you know, we, we long for the day when there are native women attorneys, but we're just not there yet. And so it, we really can't represent that in the world of children's books. Uh, at that time, like Jenna's cousin Elizabeth, who I will show you, who happens to be the Afro-Indigenous character, I was in fact a Native woman with a law degree myself. I'm a graduate of the University of Michigan Law School. Um, but that, that was my first hint that there might be a lot of work to do when it came to dispelling misconceptions and perhaps even uh, low or false expectations. Since 2000, I've published books, short stories, and poetry that are both mainstream, everything from a Santa Claus story and a tall tale to vampire princesses, to indigenous-focused literature for all age markets and formats read by kids and teens. Uh, when I first began doing school visits and other author events with young readers, I was struck by how many children consistently referred to Native people and Indigenous tribal nations only in the past tense. So my writing and that of many of my Indigenous writing peers emphasizes that we have a past, yes, that continues to inform us, a present, which is vital, but also a future. It's inclusive of daily life narratives. Um, as mentioned, perhaps we don't want to be solely defined by exclusively those bad things that happen to us. Daily life narratives like this book, Indian Shoes, which is about the adventures of a young boy and his grandpa in the city of Chicago. These include pet sitting during a snowstorm, getting awkward haircuts, and entering a school art competition. Well, Books like this, they were available in limited, limited numbers when I was a child, but mostly from small presses, mostly self-published. They didn't often appear in the average neighborhood public library or classroom. Um, when I was a child as an avid reader, I don't recall ever coming across a contemporary narrative until I was well into my 20s. Um, but here in a book like Indian Shoes, we have not only contemporary characters, but urban Indians, which is the majority of the population. Chicagoans, they are Cubs fans. Um, today, we've sort of uh, taken that to the next level as a community. Native Kidlet is tremendously collaborative. There is a lot of mentorship going on. And part of that is my role as author curator of a new imprint called Heart Drum, which is published by HarperCollins Children's Books. It is Native Focus. That means the authors, the illustrators, the voice actors. Uh, it's really a comprehensive effort to add more narratives that center contemporary Native kids as heroes of their own stories and books that welcome every child into the storytelling circle. They're published in cooperation with We Need Diverse Books, which is a nonprofit organization mentioned earlier that's dedicated to improving diversity on the page behind the bylines and throughout the industry. Our first heart drum list debuted in 2021 and we are publishing books for all age groups of young readers from picture books through young adult novels. Again, our emphasis is contemporary to send the message that indigenous people and tribal nations are still here. We make every effort to center young native heroes in our books. We're mindful that there's a lot of intersectional diversity within Indian country. It is by no means a monolith, not only from tribe to tribe, but also within each. Now, for those of us who haven't perhaps been reading a lot of Native children's books lately, um, what does that look like in practice? A few examples. 
Ancestor Proved, which I edited, featuring this gorgeous art by Navajo Nicole Meadhart, is a collection of interconnected stories and poems centered on kids attending an intertribal powwow. Healer of the Water Monster by Navajo Brian Young, cover by Navajo Shante Begay, is about a boy who visits his grandmother on the Navajo reservation and makes friends with spiders, comes to the aid of a Navajo water monster. The Sea in Winter by Christine Day of Skagit features this gorgeous cover by Michaela Gold. Michaela is the Indigenous Caldecott winner who was mentioned earlier as one of our shining stars. We're so excited. Um, in the aftermath of an injury, a young dancer learns to heal on more than one level with the support of a loving family. And one more, Jojo McCombs, the used to be best friend by Ojibwe Dawn Quigley and Tara Audibert is about a little girl living on an Ojibwe reservation who loves her cat Mimi and her classmates at school, although sometimes things get a little bit complicated with friends. Uh, it's funny and it's well, it's cute, okay? This is a book that a child can walk into a bookstore and is gonna pick up and say, look how shiny this is, look how fun I am going to have joy reading this and an indigenous child will find in it native joy, respect for elders and understanding of life ways, a priority of tribal languages. So, you know, we look forward to doing a vast array more of picture books coming out in a couple of years. We have some young adult novels on the horizon. The first one up will be The Summer of Bitter and Sweet by Jen Ferguson, which is a Matisse story that is centered on a bit of romance, you know, very important to some teen readers, and also a family mystery. Books like these, they do so much. They, they, they correct stereotypes. For the kids who aren't indigenous, they're gonna send a message that, um, you know, we didn't all die out in the 1800s. They push back against the idea that we're somehow savages or supernatural creatures. And for kids who are native, they send the message that, hey, someone who has this quality in common with you belongs in the world of books. Taking it to the next level, it says that quality doesn't wholly define you. It is one beautiful, loving aspect of who you are, because we're showing a range of non-stereotypical characters who reflect the fullness of their humanity and have a tremendous emotional range. And, you know, with every kid, it offers them a chance to enjoy fresh, entertaining, page-turning narratives that'll have them reaching for more books and more books and more books. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to bust out into a uh, Whitney Houston Dolly Parton song about the children are our future, but this really does matter. If you're a fourth grader today, um, your population, the population that will be coming of age will be leading um, not only the United States or North America, but beyond in the global community. They're already at a point where cross-cultural literacy is every bit as important as literacy in terms of what we think of as words on the page or we think of as visual literacy. Cross-cultural literacy is a key to a better, more united and positive future for all young readers. Thank you so much, Cynthia. That was amazing, amazing. And uh, not only a, a strong call to action for all of us, but I think one of the things we value so much is, in, is all of the work that you've done both as author and curator. Um, it's just so inspiring. Thank you for your creativity, your leadership, um, your continuing publishing and, um, and, and creating a better world for all of our children um, and our communities. Um, I wanted to thank all of our panelists for their wonderful conversation and the innovative work that all of them are doing. Uh, to increase representation in children's literature. Um, we're gonna adjust a little bit and um, uh, right now go um, to chapter three. Um, so I wanna thank everyone uh, for, for being thoughtful and, and wonderful today. Um, I'd like to invite um, the first panel uh, members from chapter one to join our chapter two panel members. Um, and we are going to the fan final chapter of our event um, a call to action, our magic wand wishes. Um, and so I'd like to everyone 
uh, come into the room. Thank you so much. There are two questions that we have for you today. Um, we have heard from all of you on the current landscape of diversity in children's literature. What we know is that there's been wonderful work done to advance representation. We have a long way to go and much more work needed to be done. We hope at this point in our event, our audience feels informed and inspired, but we'd really like to focus now is on our call to action. Um, what are the actions that we can take, whether as parents or caregivers, educators, community leaders, a librarian, a provider, what can we do to keep building on the momentum? With this in mind, um, I have two questions to share for you. The first one is a, a question that did come from the audience, and I think it's a very important one that faces us today. Uh, with um, In light of all of the current increased book banning that is, um, that is going on, especially around um, our communities of color and um, um, our, our books that involve um, diversity. Um, how can practitioners and professionals, uh, what can we do about that to confront the book banning? And I know that we um, uh, may go a little bit over our time, but I'd like for you to all address that. And if you could be brief, that would be great. So who would like to start? Well, I'm happy to start because I actually have to hop off because I got to go do a parent teacher conference. Okay. Um, at the top of the hour. I'll just, I'll just briefly say that to me, we should be actively engaged, right? Because they may be coming after quote unquote adolescent or youth books, but who to say, who is to say whether they come after books for young children who just talk about eating watermelon or who talk about a lot of the books that talk about a lot of our civil rights leader in really child uh, uh, faith in a child affirming ways. So to me, I think what we can do is to make sure that we are active, even if it's right to our senators, whether it's even writing to our teachers and saying, we love these books, please make sure that these books stay with us. So I think you just have to be, at least use whatever mechanisms you have, whether it's your social media feed, whether it's your word of mouth, whether it's your job, and also buy the book, particularly books by about and by people of color, but also books about people of color. So the more we buy those books, the more we show our money matters. Thank you, Dr. Aruka. Anyone else want to chime in on that one? I'll, I'll jump in quickly and just say, I think I, 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 you, you're spot on, Dr. Aruka. I think uh, number one, it's about uh, collective action. You know, it's amazing. Uh, some of these stories about the book banning, it's like two parents who, you know, lit up a school board meeting and, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll confess, I haven't gone to a school board meeting. It's time. It's time we went to, we all have to do this. You have, we have to be visible at the school board level, at the school level, and we have to be just as vocal and just as adamant as the people who are lighting up these issues. And the second one, again, uh, seconding uh, Dr. Ruka's statement, uh, it's about the Benjamins, you know? Uh, it, it's, uh, the, there is a color that the publishing industry, who I love, they respond to and it's green. And so we've got to spend our money. We've got to buy collectively. So please sign up with us if you're serving kids in need, but all of us have to be out there uh, putting our money on the table because it, this, this issue has never been more critical. Thank you so much, Kyle. Anyone else want to share? I'll chime in quickly. Hey. Thank you, please. I've been working with teachers and librarians for over 20 years. They know the kids, they love them. They are so deeply invested in making the right choices for the students that they care for and raise up every day. We need to trust in their expertise. We need to, we need to pay them well. There should never be a time when a teacher is dipping into their personal funds to try and staff a classroom library. We need to really get behind the reading and literacy professionals who have been doing this work for a long time, who know what works and what doesn't, who understand what our age relevant text is and give them all the love and support we've got on every front. Thank you, Cynthia. And if I, I would, could, oh, go ahead. I would, sorry, I would add um, not only going to school board meetings, but you can also um, go to your library, public library board meetings. So that's where a lot of the 
of censorship attempts are also happening. And writing letters to um, the editor of your newspaper, um, writing letters to your local city council, uh, to your local school board, just letting your uh, opinions be known because the people who are engaged in these bannings, they are very loud. And sometimes they are just a few people. And uh, something uh, an attorney once told us when we were facing an issue with a, a group called Parents Against Bad Books in Schools uh, was that just two parents making a lot of noise and um, with all due respect to Shabazz, he said, never swat at a bee. <laughs> um, but I do think this is a, a national um, issue right now. Um, these things are happening on a local level, but there does seem to be some sort of underlying national organization to it um, or lists being exchanged or whatever. And I also, would like to think about what is it that the people who are behind this are so afraid of? Um, they seem to be afraid of talking about race, of talking about history, about talking about sexuality. And um, I think sometimes it can help to have a conversation with someone who is that afraid of living in our current world. Um, but it, it just, uh, it really, it really amazes me how frightened people seem to be of difference. I mean, we're talking about diversity. This is a subject that frightens a lot of people. And I don't understand that fright. I would like to be able to understand it so I can understand um, where all of this is coming from. Thank you all. Um, I'd like to move on to our additional question. And, um, and thank you all for that perspective. You've helped us out a lot. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the American Library Association and the Office for Intellectual Freedom and also supporting your school librarians. They, they are a big part of um, the support that we need to advance our work in diversity in children's books. Um, so let's talk about that, that chapter three, which is which, what's your magic wand wish for children's books. Um, if you could please describe concrete actions you believe might be necessary um, to accomplish those wishes. And so we've got about maybe a minute per person. And if I could start with Dr. Arugo, because I know you have to leave. So if you could share with us your magic wand wish for children's books and concrete ways um, to achieve those, those wishes. You know, as a mother of two young children, you know what I want? I want books, <laughs> I have a lot, but I'll just keep it simple. I want books that literally show the array and diversity of blackness, like from the black skin to what black people do, just to just show that unapologetically. I just want uh, those kind of books out and available. And I even want books that show different ways of speaking, right? So there are different African American English sort of uh, uh, language that kids speak. And it'd be great if the books also capture those kind of languages and show that that's just as good as say Spanish and Hmong and other kinds of language systems. So I would love to see those books. And then my own final wish is that I would love to see books that, that really does have that racial diversity, but also shows the uniqueness of each person in their positionality. And to do that, that means that we have to make sure that we are starting early to tell particularly black children and also other uh, minoritized children that their words matter, that what stories they have to tell matters and give them the opportunity to both tell their story and also be able to visually represent their story and also allow them to publish, right? Not just have to you know, independently publish, but provide the platform, the access, and also make sure they get paid equitably to their white authors. So that's my only wish that I have. What great wishes. Um, Phil, can we go to you next? Maybe. Hey, um, so I, my key word, I've listened to all this, it's so, it's so wonderful, I feel so inspired, um, is, is show up, you know, actually, like the thing that you were talking, I'm going back to the last question, but it's like, we need to be everywhere and everywhere with conceivably hostile, you know, environment as in like school board meetings, you know, like it's like, but we need to be there to, to listen, you know, but we also need to show up at our partners. Again, there's all kinds of partners you can work with and they don't know that we can be, 
that, that there's even opportunities to, again, bring books about BIPOC experience, about diverse experience into the hands of readers. But the other thing that even, going to, so that's like finding new ways for us to connect, but even going existing way for us to connect. I'm just thinking about as a publisher, it's very frustrating to me to go to bookstores and says, oh, they, you publish these diverse books. So it goes to the multicultural column. You know, and it's like these books need to be every part of a bookstore or libraries, but it's like, oh, it just or or that I find that I have to choose is that do I market this book, you know, because I look at Shabazz's book is brilliant, but this it has to go to the multicultural shelf or does it go to an environmental climate shelf or actually well, like we, we reviewed his books under, I mean, you know, uh, under cookbooks before and, and it's like, you know, where do these books go? And we need to have new ways um, to look at where we bring books to the readers. Again, for existing places as well as new places. Thank you so much, Philip. Um, Cynthia, would you like to go next? Your magic uh, one wish? My one wish is that um, we have a world of books in which any kid can see heroes that reflect key aspects of them and see themselves as members of a community of books, that they will say, this is a place I'm welcome, this is a place that I belong. A couple quick practical ideas for that. Um, I'd love to see outreach at urban Indian health centers like the one in Portland, American Indian Center like the one in Chicago, uh, the Haskell uh, Art Market in Lawrence, Kansas. That would be a great venue. I personally, as an author, try to make a point to do a lot of events in juvenile detention centers. And I've had some of my most resonant and thoughtful conversations with young readers in that particular venue. And every one of them should have an excellent library that is inclusive and equitable. Thank you so much. Um, Shabazz, would you like to go next? I would, thank you. You, you, you know, I, I think if I had a magic wand, um, I would help to open the eyes to all the storytellers. You know, I think that the thing is we think, oh, there is no black storytellers. So how can I tell the black stories, right? How can I tell the native and indigenous stories, right? Uh, but it, uh, unfortunately, you know, I, I get people in my inbox all the time. Hey, I got a book. I got a book. How do I, I saw you have a book. How do I do a book? They're there. We're here. You know, why is it all the black indigenous and people of color produce their books, sort of self-publish their things? You know, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm grateful for publishers like Philip, who, who sort of found my found me on a blog somewhere and asked me to do a book. But, you know, uh, but but most people don't have that opportunity. So I, I represent sort of the one percent of my community, the one percent of the people that sort of, hey, somebody decided to uh, take a bet on a book. But there's just so many more stories. We're here. We're black and we're making book stacks. That's what I like to say. And so I love KT's charts and systems out there because all the things, you know, I, 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 I love I love all that. But I bet if you, you find all the people who sort of self-publishing and, and creating stories and are sharing these stories in their back steps and on their, their lawns, you know, th that percentage of, 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 of those sort of multicultural books would skyrocket, right? Like we need, like if I had a wand, I would tell all the major book publishers to go and look in different places for these storytellers because we're here. I love the imprints that you're doing, um, Cynthia. You know, I, I love that you created a whole line of books. You know, the other day I read a I read, been reading Root Magic with my kids. And, you know, it's such an incredible little story that I'd never even heard before. You, you, you know, these little stories. And, and they're my stories. I didn't even know my stories. And so uh, if I had a wand, it would be to open the eyes for publishers to see that there are more of us out here making books and wanting to make books. Um, I, I talked to Philip the other day. I told him I got a stack of 10 books that I'm planning. Um, and so, and like, where, where are the publishers? Where are the publishers to produce these things? So, uh, so that, that, that is, uh, if I had a wand, I would open up the eyes for, for, for us to take more chances. And, and the other thing, the second thing I would say is, is that, is that we would open up, right now we look at the library and the bookstore as are really the two places we're gonna get books. 
but programs like the Imagination Library that Dolly Parton holds is incredible, right? If we can't, if they're banning books in schools, let's send it to the kids' houses. <laughs> let's just send it. Let's just send it to the houses. I mean, I mean, like, is that's a library too, isn't it? I mean, like, there's, there's, there, I mean, we, you, you, you know, there's got to be a new way that we think about, think, think about these things, and, and, and there's got to be a third, a third, a third, a, a sort of way that we're thinking about this other than the bookstores and, and, and the, and the, and the school libraries. Um, so, anyways, those are my magic wand dreams. Thank you so much, um, Katie, and then followed by, by Kyle. Well, Shabazz pretty much said everything that was my magic wand um, and had some great ideas too. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have, I'm going to open up a really big magic wand that I don't have any concrete steps for. And that is to break down economic barriers because there are so many economic barriers to getting books to kids from the producing the books like Shabazz was talking about, um, to distributing them, to getting kids the books. And I do believe, um, as um, uh, was said earlier, that buying books is really important. Um, I often quote the poet Alexis DeVoe, who says, buying a book is a political act. And I just encourage people, when you do buy a book, to think about that. Think about what your money is saying with the books you buy. And um, I personally make it a point to buy as many books by and about people of color, particularly by people of color, uh, black indigenous people of color as I possibly can, um, because I think of those words frequently. If there is a way to get through the economic barriers for children, um, I would love to have thoughts about that. And Kyle, thank you, Katie. Um, KT. You don't mind, I'm gonna jump in real quick, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, Bye. go ahead, Philip. Oh, I just wanted to just quickly second, like Katie, because, you know, I just want to say books are so, so justice. It's not the content, but access to books itself is already, is, is addressing social justice. And again, with the food organizations that I work with so much, food, I mean, we want to make clear, books and reading is as important as food. You know, and that's why I'm so happy to see that a lot of food organizations is getting involved in distributing distributing books, uh, distributing books. And and again, I want to thank you, Kyle. Like for we've been working with First Books for a long time, and what the older partners that you work with is really important because those are really new places to get books into the hands of readers. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Philip. We love Lee and Lowe. You know that we, uh, uh, Katie, you and I should talk because that's the economic barrier to book ownership is what we've spent 30 years on. Uh, and, and I'd love to, you know, to explain it to you. And, and if I had a, you know, the truth is, as I hear all of these great ideas, I think that uh, fundamentally, we don't need a magic wand. What we need is collective action. That's what we need. And we all know it. And I know why it doesn't happen, because we've all got that like death grip on our own steering wheels, you know, and we don't and that bandwidth to be able to reach out, you know, uh, uh, across organizations and build something together. That is what is going to crack this, these issues open. That's what's going to do it. Uh, and and that's why and and maybe I will you know make this the big pitch back to Patty. That's why gatherings like this are so critically important because uh, we learn about wonderful things that each of us are doing. Uh, and and now the follow up is you know if we don't follow up. All it is is an intellectual exercise, a wonderful one. Uh, and, and I've loved hearing everybody's perspectives, but we got to roll our sleeves up, you guys. We got to roll our sleeves up and get about the, the action. Thank you so much, everyone. And you are absolutely right, Kyle. What a great way to, to end that magic wand theme by a call to action and not just a call, but we need to put it into motion. Um, this has really been an incredible, insightful, and inspiring event. Um, so my sincere thanks to all of our panelists and to our amazing audience for joining us today. Um, to close our event, I'd like to now invite um, Cynthia 
to share a few passages from one of your books. Tell us why you chose those pieces of writing. Um, and please, please welcome Cynthia to the stage. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you. Uh, I'll be closing with a reading from this book, Sisters of the Never Sea. Um, it's my most recent middle grade novel published by Heart Drum. It's an indigenous retelling of J.M. Barry's Peter Pan centered on the girl characters, Lily and Wendy, who are contemporary stepsisters living in the Tulsa suburbs with their shared little brother, Michael. Uh, the book was very well received for which I am deeply grateful, but perhaps one of my favorite comments was from a well-experienced native teacher who said, at last, here's a Peter Pan story I feel good about sharing with my students and also my grandchildren. Um, at the point in the story, Peter and Belle have spirited away Wendy and Michael to Neverland. Moments later, Lily, who is scientifically inclined, afraid of heights, and of course, a member of Muskogee Nation, much like me, is flying with Peter's shadow over a vast emerald sea to bring her siblings home. If only Lily had known the stars were watching over her. If only she had known they were cheering her on. The shadow didn't offer any reassurances. It had slicked into darkness, disappeared. Lily could still sense it though. She flinched at the inky feel of its fingertips. The farther they soared from her suburban home, the more eerie the shadow seemed. Was it the chill or the fear that made her shudder? Was it the shock that magic is real? Lily peeked between her fingers, pulling her anxiety into a ball at the pit of her stomach. She used it to power through a wall of gray clouds. She tried, failed, couldn't shut down her overtaxed mind. If anything, it kicked into highest gear. What if she fell, drowned, was stung by a jellyfish? What was happening was terrifying in so many ways, yet buoyed by fairy dust, Lily managed not to spiral into despair. Yes, she struggled with panic, but hope blazed inside her. To stay afloat, to stay alive, she had to embrace wonderful, lovely thoughts. Jingles, Michael, moccasins, mama, buttered popcorn, windy blue dumplings, John science books, daddy fishing, Auntie Lillian, Christmas spot, Papa George, ribbon skirts, Lily herself, wasn't she being heroic? Who would have guessed she could be so? <gasps> Wait, what was that enormous loud noise? Oh, not to worry. It was a jet plane, only a jet plane. Lily felt the briny wind lift her again. Wonderful, lovely Michael, she thought. His messy mop of brown hair, the way he'd bounce when he was excited. Wonderful, lovely, windy, her dimpled smile. Not just stepsister, best friend. Lily trembled, her teeth chattering. She breathed in and out slow and deep. Again, that's Sisters of the Never Sea with cover by Lloyd Cooper, a Muskogee and Black illustrator and one of the legends of our field. Great. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Wow, wow, wow. What an amazing hour and a half, hour and a half plus. On behalf of my fellow co-hosts from Too Small to Fail and the National Black Child Development Institute, thank you all for joining us today. This has been beyond inspiring. Thank you, Patty Wong, for your expert facilitation skills. And thank you, KT, Shabazz, Dr. Aruka, Kyle, Philip, and Cynthia for being here as well and for your enriching contributions to the conversation today. This was incredible. We can't do this work without all of our attendees here today. It will take the collective cross-sector collaboration to move this work forward. And as Kyle said, let's get to it. We've got work to do. We have a couple of housekeeping things that we wanted to share. Your feedback is valuable. If you could spend a couple of minutes completing the survey that's attached, um, there's a QR code here on your screen. And we will also follow up with the survey as well after this um, session that will include a recording of um, our time here together today and some of the resources that were mentioned. We want to stay in touch um, and we look forward to future conversations and future action. And as our speakers shared, there's ways that you can get started today um, to take action towards this important issue. 
Be on the lookout. Early Learning Nation is writing an article um, outlining the important takeaways from our conversation here today. And again, thank you for being here. What a wonderful way to spend the morning together. Have a wonderful day.